With us this morning, we've got Mike Barnacle on set, as well as New Orleans' Julia Reed up in Washington, D.C., New Orleans native Walter Isaacson, and also with us on the set now, Republican Senator from Louisiana uh, is with us, uh, David Vitter. He's a native of New Orleans, uh, and also from Austin, Texas, historian and professor of U.S. history at Rice University, a guy who really wrote the definitive history yes, he on did. Katrina, uh, Doug Brinkley, and he's also the author of the book, that's the book, The Great Day. Deluge, Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans, and the Mississippi Gulf Coast. Uh, David, uh, our senator, I should call you. We served. Uh, David works. We, ser we served together on the Judiciary Committee. I'm, I'm sensing a real excitement from New Orleans natives. Whether you talk about Walter, I talked to Walter Isaacson, or Julia, uh, or Arnie Duncan, who we just talked to from White right. House. New Orleans has an opportunity to be a leader in something. To be a leader in education reform. Absolutely. So, to, tell us what's going on in the schools here. Absolutely. And how you think this is well, going to... to, you know, to everybody the around the country knows the stories of failure. We all saw those stories of failure, particularly involving big government. But there are also some great Katrina stories of heroism and of opportunity, taking that opportunity. And education in New Orleans and Louisiana is one of those great stories and great opportunities. We had a dysfunctional school system here before Katrina. And then, of course, Katrina just obliterated it physically and now because of all that we have a real opportunity for fundamental reform this is the world capital now of charter schools uh, through the recovery t school district through Paul Vallis's leadership we have more charters and laboratories of experimentation here for education than anywhere else by a lot you know, and it's making making a difference let's talk about New Orleans specifically post Katrina I had you on my show very early on uh, and you were the first Republican I could get on the air to be critical of Washington, D.C. and their slow response to what was going on here. How are we doing four years later? Has, has America lost its focus over the past four years? Well, of, of course, it wasn't like right after Katrina. Nobody could expect it to be. We're making progress. One of the things I'm most focused on is hurricane flood protection, the levees. Uh, we're making progress toward what we call a true hundred year system, which we should have, knock on wood, by the 2011. What, what do you think about the federal judge who said, that Katrina was oh, basically was, a man-made disaster. I was very excited about that ruling. Finally, finally it's a ruling, finally it's an action that might begin to hold the Corps of Engineers accountable. Uh, obviously Katrina was God-made, but then on top of it you have a man-made disaster and because of what's clearly been proven to be design flaws by the Corps yep. of Engineers. And also some flaws in the response. And uh, I want to bring Doug Brickley into this because uh, in your book, actually the local paper yesterday they quoted a part of your book, and I don't mean to uh, put you on the spot, but you were, Joe, one of the first who was very critical of the uh, government in terms of the reaction to the disaster here. I don't know if we can put the full screen up. Uh, the quote that was pulled from your book, Mr. Brinkley, is this. Joe Scarborough of MSNBC was cleanly, keenly attuned to the devastation along the Gulf Coast, wrote Douglas Brinkley in his book, The Great Deluge, Hurricane Katrina, New Orleans, and... The Mississippi Gulf Coast, a former congressman from Pensacola, Florida, Scarborough pulled no punches in describing the lack of federal aid reaching the region. Every evening of the coming week, with a sledgehammer directness, he shamed FEMA and the Red Cross, among other relief agencies, for the snail's pace of their rescue and relief process. His emotions were raw, and his diagnosis of the failures was right on the mark. Doug Brinkley... Uh, 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 by the way, Barnacle, I, uh, the okay. check I wrote Brinkley <laughs> clear. <laughs> and it really Take yeah. Uh, it cleared. He, he, the car with well, he, moved, he moved to Texas. Yeah, I you were did a good you thing. Free Starbucks coverage. mug for that. I, well, I you, yeah, yeah, you do get free Starbucks for life. Your coverage was right on the mark, and Doug Brinkley, you take a look at that because there was sort of a delayed reaction on a number of levels in the wake of the disaster. Well, that's right. The quote you just read about Joe was true. You know, he I think took a great um, Gulf South interest growing up in Florida, like he did, and he got on the case uh, very quickly. I was doing research around the 
Orleans and uh, after Katrina and the one guy nationally who seemed to always be calling it straight was uh, Scarborough including dealing with the Mississippi Gulf which always gets overlooked in those towns right now whether it's Biloxi or uh, Gulfport or Bay St. Louis are still trying to recover uh, they got hit directly by the storm a key thing I want to mention I've been listening all morning to the talk this new court um, verdicts very important it's not the levies do you realize like if the US Army Corps of Engineers builds levies they're not uh, responsible if it floods because the US Army Corps of Engineers says look we're trying to stop where you live on a floodplain we're trying to stop floods but if we fail you can't sue us so it's not the levy victory that's occurred but it's mr. go and for the viewers around the country mr. go is the Mississippi River Golf outlet it's kind of like a Panama Canal that was built after World War II to connect the Gulf of Mexico to the port of New Orleans and ostensibly it was supposed to turn New Orleans into this uh, a, a even bigger booming port town uh, unfortunately cities like Mobile unfortunately for New Orleans cities like Mobile and Houston did a better job in modernizing their port and Mr. Go never really worked and never brought this new commerce what it did bring was destruction of wetlands it brought in salt water into the fresh water and it killed all the vegetation and you started getting a lot of erosion around Mr. Go and eventually when it wasn't really bringing the shipping in the Army Corps of Engineer completely neglected Mr. Go and this ruling now can affect about 150,000 people in St. Bernard's and the Lower Ninth that can get money from the federal government if it's if it's going to get appealed and if it goes through the Fifth Circuit Court it is a very big ruling because this ruling says that Katrina was in New Orleans a man-made disaster uh, because of the the shoddy building and the negligence of the Army Corps of Engineer in maintenancing Mr. Go. Yeah. Hey, Walter Isaacson, what do you think of the court ru ruling a couple of days ago? Does it confirm for you the worst suspicions about what the Corps and the federal government's been doing in New Orleans for a long time? Well, it does remind people that New Orleans is a hub of about one-third of the shipping that goes in and out of the country, the natural gas, the oil. So when the wetlands got hurt or when they was shoddy building of things like the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet, that was in service of the rest of the nation that needed oil and gas and get Caterpillar tractors up and grain down out of the port. So in some ways it confirms, I think, what a lot of us feel, which is uh, this wasn't just just an act of God, but it was something that, uh, uh, you know, the rest of the nation probably has a stake in saying, let's uh, help pay for this mess. Yeah, you know, yeah, the absolutely. thing, the thing, Julie, that people forget, and David, I'll throw it to you too, the thing that people forget is, I mean, anybody that lives on the Gulf Coast knows, you don't want to be, uh, you don't want your town to be east of the eye, right? Well, the eye of Katrina came in in Mississippi. Yeah. This should have never happened in New Orleans. New Orleans, in fact, when it went into Mississippi, I remember saying that night, thank God, because this is the thing, this is the thing, people, don't, yeah. the thing people don't know in the I Southeast. Celebrate. Every time the I have driven hours, in. Yeah. Everybody here thought, oh, we Ooh, avoided it, thank right. goodness. Oh, and, then, God. and then the devastation really started with the breach of the uh, canal wall. Right, we always say in the Southeast, every time we drove into New Orleans, we're only two hours away, everybody say, you know, when the hurricane comes in here, it's going to be underwater. It's going to be wiped Except off the mat. It didn't come. It didn't come. That's how much the Corps screwed things up here. Yeah, absolutely. And again, this ruling is really the first concrete way that anybody has tried to hold the Corps accountable. So I think it's uh, very, very positive and, and important in that sense. You know, Mike Barnacle, and well, actually, I'm going to David Brinkley here. David, it's Doug, very interesting. Doug. Or Doug Brinkley. Doug, um, very interesting that. I was critical not only of the federal government, of the Bush administration, of Congress, but also of the Red Cross. When the Red Cross found out I was coming back to New Orleans, uh, coming back to the Gulf Coast, they actually sent us a statement and said, in effect, make sure Joe knows we learned a lot <laughs> over the past four years. We made a lot of, of course, they were savaging me four years ago, but they said we learned a lot over the past four years. We made mistakes. We are a different Red Cross now because of the mistakes 
mistakes we made. It seems like there was a breakdown of leadership on all levels. Well, the Red Cross was abysmal. I don't think people understood that at the time of Katrina on August 29, 2005, Red Cross refused to operate in New Orleans because it was below sea level. They had marked Key West in New Orleans as too dangerous for Red Cross volunteers. So when Katrina hit and New Orleans became a bowl and the water flooded it, there was no Red Cross. They weren't operating within the city in that first uh, dark, difficult week of the storm. And so you had to get out outside of the bowl, so to speak, for triage. It was a, the worst performance of the Red Cross uh, I can think of in recent American history. They were needed to be on the spot. Instead, they um, their leadership decided to stay outside the bowl instead of inside helping people. And you had unnecessary deaths, seniors dying, people needing insulin, people um, needing a nebulizer for asthma, whatever the case may be. Mm. The Red Cross needed to be there and they weren't. And you know, it wasn't just that way in New Orleans, it was that way in Mississippi. And you know, in Biloxi, what bothered me so much is my wife and I were focused in downtown Biloxi where there was so much hardship, so much devastation. I kept asking where the Red Cross was. Finally, somebody said, oh, they're out at such and such school. I get in my car, drive 10 miles, like 10 days later, and I see these stacks of supplies up. No, I, I, and I, I, it's, I hate to you know bring up race, but it was at an all-white, wealthy suburb, wow. supplies stacked up in this high school gym, and my wife and I are sitting there with a group of church volunteers from Pensacola trying to hand out water and diapers to kids who are walking around that have been in diapers for three days. It was abysmal. And again, in the Red Crosses, I just want to say again, they have said, we have learned from the mistakes of Katrina, but you saw well, it here, did Oh, I did, and I had a friend, you know, you couldn't get back in the city unless you had a press pass or whatever. I had a friend who got in after he was turned away at the checkpoint by taking a magic marker in red and write, making a cross on a white t-shirt and tying it on, on, on his antenna. And the guy said, oh, thank God, we've been waiting for you. You're the first <laughs> Red Cross guy I've seen, and they let him in. Yeah, and David, <laughs> let me ask you really quickly. Uh, let's talk about news this weekend. Uh, I, and I, listen, I know things are very, very busy. Um, uh, up in Washington, we thank you for coming down for sure. this show. But sure. you're flying right back up. Health care tomorrow morning. Health care reform right. vote up there. Yeah. Uh, does Harry Reid have his 60 votes? Uh, I think he probably does for this first pivotal vote, but it won't be the most difficult. But this is a vote to just proceed to the matter. That'll be Saturday at 8 p.m. My guess, that's all it is, is that it would be exactly 60 to exactly 40, but we'll see. Wow. Move forward. All right. Hey, David.